Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Mountain View. Could you please join me as we repeat together our mission statement? Welcome to Mountain View United Church, a spiritual family embracing diversity and offering Christian worship, fun, fellowship, and opportunities to serve our community and beyond. Let us join together in the call to worship. Come, let all who would praise and sing of God be welcome. For the days of old God blessed many through the faithful following of Abraham and Sarah. Even this day God still calls to the faithful to follow. And let us always be faithful in all God would have us do.
Today is the second Sunday of Lent. We remember how Jesus hungered to share his message of justice, but that his message was often rejected. We think of God's promise to Abraham and Sarah, Sarah <clears throat> that they would have many descendants, even though Sarah seemed to be past her childbearing years. When Isaac was born, he became known as the child of promise. His name means laughter. All children are signs of God's promise. Like Abraham and Sarah, let us trust God and be filled with laughter. As we put out the second candle, Lenten candle, may its smoke remind us of the love of God that is all around us like the wings of mother hen protecting, protecting her chicks. Let us pray as printed in the bulletin. O oh God, we confess that sometimes we forget that each person is a child of our loss. Help us to treat each other as And let us now listen to the word of God in our first scripture reading. Let us pray. O oh God, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today, through Jesus Christ, now and forever. Amen. The reading, today's reading is from uh, uh, chap uh, John chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born from after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know, and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. 
And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but to, in order that the word world might be saved through him. Would the children please come forward? Good morning. Did you have a good March break? Yeah. Well, that's nice. I see that there's a few of us here today. Some kids are probably away enjoying somewhere on their March break. In our scripture reading we just heard are some of, I think, the most beautiful words in scripture, and that is the phrase, for God so loved the world. And I got thinking, well, just how much does God love the world? So I thought I would try to measure that. So I brought with me here a few measuring devices to see. What's that? Measuring, measuring cup. Could my mic be turned down a bit? Thank you. This measuring cup is used to do what sort of measuring? Baking, what else might you put in there? So baking for craft work, what else? Anything else? You think so? Well, let's try to figure that out. I thought, well, how much of God's love can I try to shove in here? then I thought maybe there's another way to try to figure that out. So I thought I would turn to the Bible to see if I could get the answer there. And this is the scripture I came up with. It's from Psalm 23, verse 5. How about you join with me in saying it together, okay? My cup overflows. So if you try to put God's love in here, and the cup overflows, are you able to measure it? One as big as the world, you think? No, even bigger. Even bigger. As big as the universe. That's pretty big. Well, I got thinking along those lines, and I thought I would try using another instrument that I have in here. I'm a pretty handy guy. I have lots of tools, and among those tools, I have measuring tapes. And I thought, I wonder if I could try the measure with my biggest measuring tape. Would someone like to volunteer? Okay, Sabrina, I'm going to have you walk that way slowly. And I'll walk the opposite way. Come and get it. Okay, so you go that way and I'll go this way. And that's as far as it goes. And it says that it is 10 meters long. Now, 10 meters long, Paul Property Guy. Where did he go? There he is in the chattels. How high is the ceiling of this building? About 50 feet. That's the wrong system, Paul. We have meters. But I'm going to eyeball this. 17 meters. So. Is God's love taller than this building? Because this won't even reach it, right? You think yes? I'm going to give Maria a new hobby here. She can reel that in. So again, I thought, I'm going to try to check out Scripture here. You can just let that go, Sabrina, and have a seat. And this is the Scripture I came up with. 
I know that's fascinating and all, but the action's up here, okay? <laughs> Again, it came from the book of Psalms. And it says, read it with me from Psalm 108, verse 4. For your steadfast love is higher than the heavens. How high is heaven? Does anyone know? Did anyone take uh, physics or astronomy class or anything like that? How high is heaven? That's not very far. You can't even get to the moon. Not even to the moon. Your steadfast love is higher than the heavens. So like you said, the universe, right? So I got to thinking, well, we can't measure it with a cup or with a measuring tape. I thought, how about a watch? My watch here has minute hand, hour hand. It tells the date. What other cool stuff does it do? The day of the week. It does all this stuff. Do you think we can measure how long God has loved us using a watch? Too long. Okay. Well, again, I tried to use scripture. And again, it came from the book of Psalms. The Psalms are basically the hymn book of the ancient Hebrew people. They were pretty smart people, apparently. Here we go again. Psalm 103, verse 17. Read it with me, please. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. How long is everlasting? Yep. For all eternity. For all eternity. So if that is how long everlasting is, then how long is from everlasting to everlasting? Uh, to eternity. So eternity times two. And eternity times two is still everlasting, right? So... That's a very long time, isn't it? You can't get longer than that, though, I don't think, right? Think so? Oh, okay. Well, that's another story. So, the question I have for you now is, is God's love longer than this? Is God's love longer than this? How about this? The answer is God's love is that long. What shape am I standing in right now? A cross. Exactly. Look up behind you there. That cross, what do you notice about it? It's, I'm going to give the answer, it's empty. Why? Because what happened on Easter, exactly. Jesus died on the cross, but, and this is the biggest but ever. Yep. Right, some do. But for us, our cross is empty because of what happened on Easter, that Jesus rose again. So that tells us just how much God loves us. That God's love is stronger than hate. That God's love is stronger than death. Just how much God loves each and every one of us. And we'll talk more about that in just five weeks on Easter. I'm going to invite you all to join with me in prayer. And you folks can join in as well. Dear God. Thank you for loving us all. Thank you for Jesus, who taught us how to love as you love us, with our words, with our actions. Help us to be like Jesus, sharing your love with all.
Genesis 12, verses 1 to 5. Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took his wife Sarah and his brother's son Lot and all the possessions that they had gathered and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran, and they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. Romans 4, verses 1 to 5, 13 to 17. What then are we to say was gained by Abraham, our ancestor according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now to one who works, Wages are not reckoned as a gift, but as something due. But to one who without works trusts him who justifies the ungodly, such faith is reckoned as righteousness. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, Faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, 
not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of, of all of us. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. The word of God. Thanks. Thank you, choir. That was lovely. Let us pray. Loving God, may the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> There's a story told of a newly minted ordained minister of the United Church of Canada who is preparing his very first sermon for his very first pastoral charge. He wanted it to be just right, and so he put many, many hours into it, trying to look at it in every conceivable angle. <coughs> Following that first service, one of his parishioners met with a friend in a local coffee shop, and the friend asked, so, what did your new minister talk about in his sermon? The person paused and then replied, well, he talked about faith and sin. But by the time he has finished the sermon, I don't know which one he was for and which one he was against. <laughs> My sermon today is about faith. And so I want to say right up front that I am all for faith. And incidentally, I'm against sin. Basically, there are two parts to faith. One part is our communal faith. We as Christians are part of the Worldwide Christian Church. And for us, that particularly means being part of the United Church of Canada. And we use as our guide our creeds and other basic elements of our group communal faith. 
The other part of our faith is our personal faith, the relationship we have with God through Jesus Christ. And that is based upon trust and love. Sin, simply put, is when we turn away from God, when we decide that we're going to place our trust elsewhere, perhaps in other things, other people, perhaps even in ourself. The thing that underlines our faith is honesty. Honesty about ourselves. Honesty about our relationship with God. There are two basic things, I think, about this being honest. First, if you're honest, you'll realize that you just can't go it alone. You can't save yourself. You need God, and I most certainly need God. During my very early teens, I took lifeguard lessons. And among the things I remember learning was that you can't save someone until they are ready to be saved. Because if you jump in the water to try to save them, in their panic, in their desire to try to save themselves, they will use you as their personal flotation device. They'll climb up over to you, doing everything they can to save themselves, and quite possibly in the process, they'll end up drowning you. So you have to wait. You have to wait until they are ready to be saved, until they're ready to put their trust in you that you will indeed help them and bring them to safety. Second, if you're honest, you'll admit that everything in life that you have that is good, including life itself, comes from God. This is ever so important because it leads to, again, having even greater trust, even greater faith in God. Is it any wonder then that 12-step programs such as Alcoholics Anonymous has among their key components that we must believe in God and that we can do absolutely nothing. We are powerless without having God invited into our lives. There was once a woman who was riding an elevator in a hotel. While she was riding up a number of floors around about the 20th floor, the phone rang that was in the elevator. So she went over to the display of buttons, the display buttons for each floor, and she opened that, that little door that was below the buttons, and she removed the phone and placed it to her ear. And what she heard was this, good evening. Well, this is the such and such insurance company. We would like to know if you think you have enough life insurance. Now that's not the kind of call you want to receive when you are riding an elevator, is it? <laughs> Speaking of phones, about, well, last week for five days, I received on my cell phone a particular call twice a day. Thanks to call display, I knew enough not to answer the call. It had a 1-800 number and it was from the United States, so I figured, it must be a telemarketer. Well, as I said, this went on for five days, twice a day, so I decided I would check out this 1-800 number. I went online. I punched in the 1-800 number on my search engine on my computer, and two possibilities came up. The first one said, US slash CIA. <laughs> uh-huh, I thought to myself. And after thinking about that for a moment, I decided I'm going to click on it. So I clicked on it. What did my computer do? All it did was to say that it was thinking. And the low cursor wheel just spun and spun around as the computer began and continued on with its thinking. So I thought, if the computer has to think about this, then I should move on to the next one, rather than going further with that. So I clicked on the next one and opened up a website. The website was covered completely with Chinese characters, you know, those beautiful markings that they have in their lettering. And I searched and searched down trying to find some English, but none could be found. But what I did find was literally thousands, listings of 1-800 numbers. And because they're in numerical order, I was able to find the one that had been following and calling me. 
What's my point in telling you all this? Well, my next step was I took my cell phone and after fiddling with it for a moment or two, I was able to block that number and I haven't heard from it since. Well, friends, when it comes to receiving a call from God, we don't need to have, shall we say, call or display. And if you think you can block a call from God, well, forget about it. But you can try to ignore a call from God. And in the Bible, we have many fine examples of people who have tried to ignore a call from God. But in each and every case, they failed in their attempt. Why? Because God is even more persistent than a telemarketer. How do you think Abram felt when he received his call from God? Abram and his wife Sarai's response was as such. I think we can call it one of the most pivotal points of our faith history. For their descendants would go on to form three world faiths. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. I don't sense from the story of Abram that he was in the least bit reluctant about responding to his call to answer in God. I don't hear him asking God, God, could you, uh, well, send someone else? You know, Sarah and I were quite comfortable here where we are. We've been living here for centuries with our family. No, I don't get any of that coming from him at all. And so I admire that go for broke faithful attitude that maintains a focus not on the journey because that is unknown, but rather on, sorry, not on the destination, but rather on the journey. Abram required no assurance and no insurance at all from God. Abram, who God will rename later on Abraham, and Sarai, who God will rename Sarah, I think are very much the model of faith-filled living. Much like planting a seed to grow a tree later on, the couple is asked to have faith that their children and their offspring will inherit the promises of God. In our age of mobility, I don't think we get just how radical it was at that time for Abram and Sarah to pick up everything they had and to just leave. To just leave their extended family behind. Because you see, in that time, the extended family was everything. They provided you with your identity, your protection. That was the very basis of their society, the very basis of their tribal system. So, how were Abraham and Sarah able to do this? I wonder, how many times did they question their own sanity? In the end, by maintaining their faith in God, they were able to go beyond human thinking, beyond human imagination, and were able to enter into the world of God, the world of great visions, the world of great living, living for God. Every Christian congregation in the world today is living in a time of uncertainty, but also we are living in a time of call and great promise. Individually and collectively, I think we are the present day Abraham and Sarah's of the world, called together to be a blessing to all the world. We too have a choice. Do we hunker down where we are in fear, or do we move forward in faith-filled confidence in God, that God will provide us with everything we need to carry out our mission of blessing the world? Abraham and Sarah, they opted to venture out into unknown territory with only God's promise to guide them and protect them. Indeed, in this fast-changing world, Christians, I think, oftentimes feel as if they are in a foreign land, for we certainly are no longer living in a land that is based upon Christianity. In our gospel reading for today, Nicodemus, a Pharisee, a leader of the Jews, pays Jesus a visit by night. 
Why by night? I think we can assume it's because he doesn't want other people to spot him going to visit Jesus. Why? Because Jesus was considered, especially by the Pharisees, to be very radical, very radical in his beliefs and teachings about God. As a Pharisee, therefore, Nicodemus represents all people who are on the inside of a religious institution and so are reluctant to change. And yet, and yet, Nicodemus feels himself being drawn toward Jesus. Change is risky and without guarantees. That is, unless we're focused upon God, unless we trust in God's leading. Nicodemus, we can assume, by his position as a Pharisee, has accomplished everything that a good, faithful person is supposed to accomplish. And yet, he feels deep within himself that something is lacking. And so, what happens? The Spirit of God calls him to approach Jesus. And in this encounter, he becomes a fearless follower of God through the teachings of Jesus. Why fearless? Because later on, Nicodemus in John's Gospel is mentioned one more time in chapter 19, in which we learn that not only has Nicodemus become a follower of Jesus, but he is now a member of Jesus' inner circle. Nicodemus has the bold faith and courage to actually go to Pilate. Pilate, the very one who has the authority to have anyone he wishes put to death, the one who had Jesus put to death. He goes to Pilate and he requests to have the body of Jesus given to him so that he can give Jesus a proper Jewish burial. Hundreds of years ago, sea mariners used maps to illustrate the known world. But for those parts of the world which were yet to be discovered, the map makers would write the words, here be monsters. And this was meant to be as a warning about the unknown. Now certainly our knowledge of the physical world is greater than it was at that time. But we human beings are still afraid of the unknown. Here be monsters. In the case of Abraham and Sarah, they were called upon to make a physical change to move to a foreign land. But more often than not, I think most of us are called upon to make a change right where we are. What if God wants us to do something we're afraid of? We can think of all sorts of fears, can't we, that we have when it comes to the unknown. Things we might be asked to give up. Places we might be asked to go things we might be asked to do. Our fears tend to fill us up, especially when it comes to the unknown. Whenever I feel the call of God to do something and I feel my fears starting to come in, what I've learned to do is to start digging away at those fears, to figure out what is the bottom thing under it all. And what I discover is that I lack trust at times. I lack trust that God will see me safely through. I think we tend to have that belief that God will call us to enter into some sort of wilderness and then just abandon us there, abandon us, and give us no support whatsoever. But, my friends, that is not how God works at all. As our United Church Creed begins with the words, we are not alone. We live in God's world. The good news is, and again, this is where trust comes in. God will work to remove our fears. God will work to fill us with faith. And so we will begin to soar in our hearts and discover abilities and gifts we never knew we even had until we entered and replied yes to God's call. I wouldn't be standing here otherwise. I couldn't be standing here otherwise. I don't know how it happens. I only know that it does happen. It's happening to me right now. And I suspect 
It's happening to you right now by the grace of God. Let us pray. O oh God, we give you thanks for Abraham, Sarah, and Nicodemus, for all of your faithful who have gone before us, for those who waited in patience for your promise to come to pass, for those who lived in hope while around them seemed only darkness for those who witnessed to you when it was not considered proper, for those who forgot their own self in order to respond to your call upon their lives. Help us today, O oh God, to become bold in faith. By our self-forgetting and self-denial, help us to make visible to all the reality of your loving care and support. We pray for those in our family, our church, our community, and our world that you bring to our minds at this time as we hold them up to you in our hearts, along with our prayers of thanksgiving in the silence. All these things we pray, O oh God, through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. And let us now make our offering unto God.
Let us pray. <coughs> Loving God, we ask that your blessing be upon these, our offerings, so that they may shore us up in our faith and trust and send us out to be bold in this, your world, bringing hope, peace, joy, and love to all we meet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now as Abraham and Sarah did, let us go out into the world answering the call to bring hope, peace, joy, and love, the good news of Jesus Christ to all we meet. And the people said, Amen. Amen. 